All right, so welcome everybody to the Containers in Depth, understand how containers work to work better with containers. My apologies for the delayed start. Uh, as you know, the, the conference this year is part virtual, part live, so we were trying to make sure we got everybody on, on the virtual side as well. And welcome to anybody who's tuning in that way. Uh, my name is Brent Laster, and uh, Tech Skills Transformation is my training company. Uh, let's see if I can get the, make sure the clicker works now. Uh, a little bit about me, whoops. Not that quite quick, quick. Uh, global trainer, do a lot of training on different things. Uh, have some articles at opensource.com, a couple of books we're gonna uh, be signing after this session. And uh, there's some information at the bottom. If you're interested in connecting with me on social media, feel free to reach out or to follow uh, the Tech Up Skills is Twitter for the company. Uh, the professional Git book, check it out if you're interested in learning more about Git, either beginner or advanced. Uh, Jenkins 2 up and running. If you're interested in learning about pipelines, continuous delivery, those sorts of things, I uh, wrote this to be kind of an introduction to Jenkins as well as understanding more about continuous delivery and how to do pipelines as code and that. If you do go and get this one, I suggest getting the electronic version, the printed version, unfortunately, which that's one I'll signing, but it has some, uh, the screenshots are kind of washed out. Um, I think they're still readable, but depending on reviews you read, um, people disagree. So. Anyway, I also have quite a bit of training on O'Reilly. If you ever get on O'Reilly's platform, uh, check, search for my name, you'll find things on Git, Kubernetes, all sorts of fun stuff. Love doing that. Uh, and of course, if you have an account on O'Reilly, training is available to you. So let's talk about uh, what are containers. And I apologize that the title is kind of off the top there. Didn't notice that now, but uh, so what is a container? So a container is sort of a standard unit of software that uh, functions like a fully provisioned machine. What does all that mean? Basically, it allows you to have a, uh, a set of resources in the operating system that allow an application to think that it's running on its own machine. So it's carving out that set of resources from the operating system pieces to be able to create that environment that the application thinks it's running on its own. Uh, it is a standard unit of software, a way of packaging software. We talk about packaging up container images. The images are the basis for the containers. They are the things that we uh, set up, just like we might provision a machine where we install software and set up the environment, set everything we want. And when you talk about containers, you will always see the obligatory picture of the container cargo ship with the containers on its back to remind you of uh, how it's self-contained. So what's in a container? Well, in a software container, which we're kind of uh, illustrating here by a hardware, or I guess a um, actual container, you have things like the app, you have things like the runtime, you have things like the dependencies, the uh, settings, the system libraries, any of the kinds of things that you might need to run your application on an actual uh, bare OS or infrastructure machine, you can have in a container. Uh, system tools as well. So that's why we have container. And the little symbol you see there is the whale. That's the symbol for Docker with the containers on the back. And Docker is one of the main applications we use and still use to run with containers. So when we talk about containers, though, a container is not a VM, a VM here being a virtual machine. If you've ever used something like VirtualBox, you probably have run virtual machines uh, running on top of VirtualBox to be able to do, to do something. But a container leverages uh, okay, let's plug into an hour power outlet here. Uh, container leverages the operating system resources to be able to actually do what it does, to be able to carve out the pieces it needs. Bear with me one second here while well, I make sure we don't. Here we go smoothly. All right, let's put this in here. All right, hopefully that'll make you happy. So container is not a VM. VM uh, has several other pieces. I'll show you a slide about that in just a moment. Uh, containers are running instances of what we call images. Uh, hey, everybody, if you want to come in, I think there's any more seats or just uh, places on the floor if you want to make sure kind of spread out. So images define what goes into a container. Containers are built from images. We're using this word images a lot. Let's talk about uh, a little bit more about what is a container image. Well, a container image is a read-only template. Read-only meaning we can't change once an image is created. We create an image as the basis for what the container is going to be using 
in terms of things like the operating system, the various applications, all the things we saw that went into that box. Container images are like a snapshot of a container. It's a point in time. One of the analogies I use for people to help understand this, I think works pretty well, is this idea that if I am installing uh, software on a new computer, if anybody in here technical support for your family or technical support at work or something, okay. If you've ever provisioned a machine for somebody else or for a family member and a user at work or something, you probably have gone through the process where you sat there and you've done installed software on it, installed the operating system, installed applications, maybe the office suite, installed maybe antivirus things, those kinds of things. And you have provisioned or set up all of those instances, all those application or instances on that system. Now, nobody's using it yet, but you've actually set everything up on the disk. Same idea for an image with a container. You're setting up that image with everything provisioned on it here. And these images are generally considered to be immutable. Immutable is a fancy word that means they don't change. And we'll talk about why they don't change in a minute and what the difference is. So immutability though doesn't imply that containers themselves can't have things written in them. It's just the basis of the images that we use to create them are considered immutable. Uh, so when we talk about an image layer, there's a diagram here I stole from uh, some of the Docker documentation, but a Docker image is built up from a series of layers. If we were to go and look at those layers, they're actually managed as different directories stored on your file system with unique identifiers. In them is the differences, the things that we've added into each layer. Again, you might think of it as uh, installing an operating system as one layer, installing, configuring something as a different layer, copying some files from your local drive to be on that image as a different layer. So when we do this, we build up, we stack these layers on top of each other. Each layer is only the set of differences from the last one. And you can think of the base layer or the base is usually being an OS image. Now, in some cases, when you get an image down, it may be an operating system image, but more often than not, it is an image that somebody else has already constructed, which has applications on it, has all the pieces on it. For something like MySQL, a database processing, or uh, a web server, those kinds of things. Each layer is read only except for the last one. So the last one is the top one we're talking about there on this, this white box here. So the difference between an image and a container, an image is a set of provision software, the environment that we've already created there to support running an application. The container, what makes an image into a container is putting this sort of thin, they call it thin, because uh, it doesn't have much content in it initially, thin read-write layer on top of it. So a container is just that image layers with the read-write uh, layer on top of it where you can actually uh, make changes to it and convert things to it. Each layer is read only except for the last one. That last layer, the topmost layer, is where all changes go into. And by the way, I'll go back here just a second. Uh, what we see up here on the upper right is what's called a Docker file. This is like the recipe or the steps that you use to create uh, an image. Uh, you can see there it's copying something from Ubuntu. That's a base image that somebody has set up that contains the operating system, copying some local files, doing some other operations. And for the most part, each one of those instructions will result in a new layer in the image. They've gotten a little bit more efficient about it where it doesn't always have creating a new layer every time. So a VM, we mentioned that a VM is different. When we have a VM, we have to run on a program called a hypervisor. That is like something like VirtualBox, which is the application that sits on the, your host operating system on your machine and then allows you to run the virtual machine on it. The difference with Docker is again, Docker is an application that runs on your host machine and then carves out those different resources to be able to have that application have its own effective uh, computer or system to run in. Because it doesn't have to do the hypervisor, Docker is gonna be faster to start up, more portable, and uh, the image can run unchanged in multiple environments. And by the way, Docker isn't the only game in town anymore. There's a couple more we'll talk about towards the end of the course uh, that come into play here, but Docker is the one that most people know. In fact, for a long time, Docker was sort of just associated directly with uh, containers or people made that association. When we talk about what happens here with creating and tracking layers to images, on the left-hand side, there is a Docker file, which is, has a set of instructions. And you can see there it says from MySQL. So when we actually do a Docker build, the Docker build says, go through the steps in the Docker file, get the files that I need, do whatever I need to do. So what's happening on the right-hand side there 
is that it's going out to the Docker Hub, the main repository for Docker images, public one, and it's grabbing the MySQL base image, that 5.5.45. And you can see as it's going, it's pulling down these different layers. These are layers. These are the steps that somebody put in there, the things somebody put in there to make that MySQL image and to make it work and configure and all that. So as it's going down, it pulls them down and gets down to complete, and then it starts extracting them out. And so it does that. Then it will move on to the next thing, which is copying in some files locally, and then moving on until it's finished, doing all the steps there. When we finish with that, what we have is we can have a, a good idea, a good representation of how we can map these instructions to the layers, to the image that we can then base a container on. If you look at this, I know it's probably uh, tiny on the screen there, but if you look at the left-hand side, we've got the Docker file again with the set of instructions that we're using to create the image. We've got then the example where we downloaded the things and got them down to our local system, which is stored in the Docker area where Docker is set up. And then down below that, we've got a Docker history. And Docker history shows you all of the layers that went into the image. Now, some of them are marked missing on the side because it doesn't have the exact ID that was used to that. It just has that one image that has the layers inside of it. But if you are able to see on the that big white rectangle on the bottom, you can see things like setting up an environment variables, ENV, MySQL, commands and stuff. These are the steps that somebody went through to create that initial MySQL image that we're using and then to add other things on it. And each one of those essentially equates to a layer. Now, again, we pulled the MySQL, we had all of those layers already there and somebody had already gone through and set it. So if we think about how to map this, we can think about the instruction in the Docker file mapping over to the pulling down of that base image and then creating a layer into an image. Likewise, that has all those pieces in it that went into the MySQL piece. Likewise, the, each, each instruction in turn goes in and creates another layer. Now, again, not all of them these days will create in a layer, but that's the best way to think about it here. And for this purposes, that's the way it is. So as we have an instruction, it causes some sort of activity to happen, which creates a difference or a set of changes that are put as layers. And then Docker itself is going to be responsible for keeping track that those four layers make up that particular image. The layers themselves are stored out in the Docker area as just individual directories. And we could get into a lot of detail about it, but I don't think that would be, uh, that, that would probably be too deep for what we wanna talk about here. But you can get the idea. We have these layers of changes that are built up and all of those layers together form an image. And this image, by the way, these pieces here are considered uh, read only or immutable. Again, a fancy word, they're not gonna be changed, so read only. And I'll talk about the reasons more about that in a moment, but we create a container from an image via the Docker run command if you're using Docker. And again, all it does is really to just add this thin additional layer on it that you can read and write into it. So one of the questions that comes up a lot is how does this all work? How do we go through and modify files and change things and get the access there? Well, there's a couple of Linux basic functionality for Linux containers, um, LXC, that were built into Linux that Docker really takes care of. Docker really uses. Docker was really just an, an interface, a specification, a command line, REST API, on top of those underlying functionalities that have been around in Linux for a long time. So one of the things that comes up if you have it that it uses is called the union file system. Uh, it's this kind of like a drill down. So if you think about starting at that top layer and looking for a file, as we said, whenever you pull down that content or create those layers, they have different content in them. Each of those is the result of executing some command in that Docker file. So there were some set of changes made. So when Docker is looking for a file, it can do this union, uses the union file system functionality of Linux to be able to drill through it to find there. Think top down, kind of looking through it. Uh, one of the ways I tell people to think about this, think about it like the path on a computer. If you've ever set the path in an operating system, you know the idea of having multiple directories. I look here first, if I don't find it, I look in the next one, I find the next one. Same sort of idea with what we call the union file system. Now, one of the things that comes up is what happens when we need to actually modify a file. I've already said that these layers are kept as read only. Well, they actually use some, some kind of, a, I don't say tricks, but cool things to be able to do that. For example, if I need to modify a file here, 
what happens when that actually needs to be changed is they do what's called copy on write or cal, as I call it, which means basically we copy it up to the writable layer. So they copy it up to the writable layer, that area where we can change things, and then it's available there and we make the changes there. And because of the union file system, when we look here, we'll find that new copy here before we find the one here. So it stands in place of it. So when that happens, then we can make changes to files that are inside the, the lower layers. They're just copies that are brought up to a higher layer. Now, one of the cool things, because those read images are read only and the container is just an extra read write layer, we can actually have multiple containers built off of the same image because all it has to do is add a different read write layer for that. You way to think about this, think about multiple users using the same computer, right? You have the basic operating system, you have it all configured, but different users can log on, but at some level, they're still using some of the core, the core pieces that are installed on there. The same idea, you have a different read write area here, so you can have multiple containers. And the other cool thing is that if you have uh, if you have some of the layers already there, when you actually pull it down, when you actually go to update another image that uses those layers, the layers are already present. Because again, the image is just made up of layers that are chained together. And that thin read write layer on top makes it the container. So we can actually have, uh, we can actually use those same layers. By default, if you're using Docker, they're gonna be stored in var live Docker. And if you go out there, as we'll talk about in a minute, you'll see are a lot of different directories and links and stuff, but the basic idea is still the same. We have a directory for each layer. We have then, uh, we have the content in those directories and we chain them together to make the images. So when, what is Docker? As I already mentioned, it's basically an interface on top of that leverages these underlying uh, Linux functionalities. It has the REST API. It's a specification for how to create images, what they should look like, what containers should look like, and allows you to access them. It has a nice command line reference in there. And they leverage just the three functionalities that we, one, the union file system we've already talked about. The other two are namespaces and groups or control groups. Just to give you a quick idea of what a control group is, control groups are, are groups, processes for our, our processes for the purpose of managing different system resources. So if we think about it as system resources being things like CPU, memory, IO, and network, what we have to do for the containers that we're running is each of them gets kind of a piece of the pie. So for C group helps to manage these pieces of the pie for the different, for the containers, for the images to make sure they have a piece of it to work with. Now, this is leveraged by Docker to share system resources among containers. Uh, and includes things like, as we said, network, memory, and such. Windows has a variant of this. Windows has moved more into the uh, native Windows containers world and such as well. On there, they have a variant called job objects, if you're interested. So uh, the other part that we leverage in the underlying Linux functionality is namespaces. These provide isolated instances of a global resource. Again, this idea of carving out pieces of resources on the system to be able to have this your application that's running in the container think that it has its own system to run on. So when we talk about the different uh, resources here, there are things like process IDs, allows process in different containers to have the same process ID, basically separating them out, logically separating them out in the system. We have the network. Networking allows us to have isolation, things like network controllers, system resources, networking, firewall, routing tables. We have mount points, mounts that allow us to set uh, file system mount points seen by a group of processes so that each container can have its own temp or its own bar directory. So these are all the things that this functionality is managing for the different containers. Uh, Interprocess communication to isolate uh, different things like message queues and such. And we have the user and resources specifying range of host of UIDs and uh, Unix time sharing service to isolate uh, node names, domain names per call. So this is all that sort of thing. Uh, let's take the global resources available in the operating system and separate them out or separate them off so that each container can have its own share and thinks it has its own uh, its own uh, dedicated set of these. So when we talk about <clears throat> a Docker file, we've already mentioned what, we've already seen a couple of things. 
But again, it's basically just a recipe or a step-by-step -step thing. If again, if you've ever provisioned a system, ever uh, done that at work or for a relative or something, you probably have had some kind of a checklist or a steps you go through that says, install this operating system from here, uh, install this application from this place, copy these files off from the user space, from a USB drive or something onto the system, do this configuration, same kind of idea, same kind of approach, just a step-by-step -step thing that Docker runs through and follows this. The from, the arg, copy command, those are all commands that actually are understood by Docker as to how to construct the image. When we get down to things like entry point, that means what thing do I start running? What program do I start running when I run a container? Remember the container is running essentially one application. You may have multiple on it, but there's always one that is the primary one that's meant to run. So the entry point script or the entry point process is what gets that application going. That and the command that actually needs to run to any kind of the uh, options or such there. Uh, when we talk, so going from Docker file to the image to the container, Docker file is a set of instructions that tells us how to create the image. We use Docker build for that, which actually takes it and then takes the go, runs through those steps, creates the image layers and creates the image for us. Then if we do a Docker run, that's where we create a container. That's where we add that extra read write layer onto the image to be able to have uh, something that can actually run the application. So Docker commands, there's a number of commands here and I won't take time to go through this, but there's a number of Docker commands for doing everything from building images, running containers to doing more of the kind of, let's see what's going on in them things like inspecting them. There's an exec command that actually lets you get inside the running container to look at the file system, almost like you're logging on to another to that, to that system and looking at it. There's Docker history, Docker things for ports, all those kinds of pieces in there. So how do we think about this? Again, I've used this analogy already, but if you think about it from the standpoint of having a blank system that you are setting up for somebody, you install these layers of software right? You install things, operating system, all the pieces we've already kind of talked about in there, and you create an image. You create an image on a disk that can then be used to provision other systems if we wanted to. When we talk about, and we have the image available with all everything already configured, whether you're actually running anything on the computer or not, that image is still there. That image already has everything installed on it, configured, set up to run, even if we're not using it. Same idea with Docker images. When we have, when we want to actually run something on it, we can provision it or we can have it set up. And the other thing we can do is we can actually create a user space. If you think about defining a user when you're sitting on there, each user on a system has their own space to work in, right? They have their own home area, home directories kind of thing, similar to the idea of that container area. It's their area to work in and make changes. In general, you're not going to have people going out and making changes to the installed software and the operating system and stuff. That's more read only off to the side. So the same idea. So maybe this is a useful analogy to help you think about the way in which containers and images all interact. Uh, and I put the pictures there of the containers and then the Docker images. Docker images, by the way, are stored in uh, repositories like the Docker Hub. Uh, we talk about Docker image registries or image registries. Images are stored there, and then images are brought down, as you saw in that uh, black screen where we were actually pulling stuff down. And then we do the Docker run to actually turn the images into a container to actually add that, that layer. But images, just like you have the image stored off separately, images for Docker are stored off too in Docker registries. Quick note about Docker on Windows and Mac, as we've been talking about in terms of Linux. Uh, Docker can run on, on Windows and Mac runs in slightly different ways. It's been done differently over time. Uh, in the past, Windows would do things like just running a Linux virtual machine to actually run Docker on because it took advantage, again, of the underlying Linux uh, functionality and depended on it. But basically on these systems, the user runs a Docker host, a process that can, that knows how to uh, allow images to be deployed and run. On Linux or Mac, the host is gonna be Linux-based, allows creating images for Linux containers, the Mac uses a HyperKit and a virtual image to actually run Docker. So we know, even though Docker is different from virtual machine, in some cases you can use a virtual machine to actually run Docker for you. The Docker desktop is the most recent uh, way they have done this, provided this. 
it actually runs for on Windows or Mac and runs host containers in a dev environment and provides some additional tooling around it. Um, it used to be free. They're actually going to start charging for it at the in January 2022 for larger companies. And there you'll have to have a license. Uh, I forget exactly how much it is, you know, per month or whatever. But Docker, it just, you know, a side note, Docker used to be the only game in town when it came to the containers and such. Uh, over time, they've struggled with their business model to monetize this, to actually make money for it. So they're making a bigger shift now to being able to charging for things they used to not charge for, like um, Docker Desktop. And also, if you exceed the number of pools from the Docker uh, Hub. So, and Windows containers, one more note here about Windows containers, there's two types of runtimes. There's Windows server containers, which are kind of native pieces, which use uh, the Windows version of the process and namespace isolation, and then Hyper-V containers, which run each container in their own VM. A little bit diving deeper into layers. So when we do a Docker pool command, the pool command is what gets things down from a registry down to our local system. It pulls those individual layers down, stores them, in the uh, Docker bar Docker area that you have there and pulls down to individual pieces. Now you see at the bottom, there's another Docker pool for a separate image. And with that Docker pool for the separate image, if one of the layers it needs is already stored locally, we can reuse that. We don't have to pull. So we're image. that's why we said when we have the images that are made up of these different layers, if the layer is already present in the file system, for what, you, for what you're trying to use, it doesn't have to download it again. It can just, it's able to just chain through those different layers and pick that one up. So if you can reuse the same image or the same layers of it, then you can actually save yourself some time and save yourself some effort in terms of having to download things again. Mapping layers to the file system. Real quick, before Docker 1.10, Basically, those layers, those sets of changes that you introduced were just I put down there and they just had a unique ID. And when you actually looked at what was in a Docker image and listed it out, you would see those same IDs. So an image was made up of layers and the layers mapped in the file system with the same ID as what you saw in the Docker image. And if you were to do a Docker inspect, which allows you to look in it, then you could see the actual pieces that went in it. After, but what happened with that was that there was a challenge. There was a challenge with security. For example, you didn't always know if something could have been changed out from under. It would be a rare occasion, but if you, somebody went in and was delivered enough, it had challenges. So what they did instead was to do content addressable IDs. Fancy name that simply says, when they store these layers there, they have a hash. They basically have a checksum or a hash that they create with that. Uh, like a SHA-256, SHA-256 secure hashing algorithm has a kind of roots in like MD5, those pieces in there, and they generate a unique ID off of that. So it's no longer about the way it's actually stored on the file system as much as it is about the checksum and stuff that it's stored in there. But again, these are just the mappings to the layers that are used underneath there. Docker image has uh, various configuration objects and things that are taken into account when you get the overall checksum as well. So storage drivers, really quickly, when you talk about how Docker manages tracking all these things and pulling things together, weaving the, the layers together to create the images, what it uses is storage drivers, also known as graph drivers. And so the Docker engine has a cache of image layers. It has that directory end of our live Docker with all the different layers under there. And the a storage driver then is required to manage them at runtime to pull everything together. And so it creates a kind of a image graph that's in there. And over time, Docker's used or have containers have used a number of different storage drivers. And you'll have the slides, I'll make the slides available uh, later on. So I won't take time to go into all this now, but it's been evolving over time. And these again are just the programs and the ways that we string things together. The common one these days is what we call the overlay two model. You hear overlay two talked about as a kind of driver. And essentially you can kind of see the analogy we've already talked about with the layers and different pieces. On the Docker side, we talk about the image layer, the uh, image layer one, layer two, the container layer on there. On the file system side, we have the overlay FS. Overlay FS is the file system driver, the file system functionality 
that overlay is based on. And so you don't have to understand a lot about this, except that it basically is just using directories. The layers here basically constitute directories as we go in through here. And there's only two directories here. For others, they have like links that are kind of, that are pulled in. So there's a lower directory, a lower directory one, two, and then the upper directory. These are just the ways that things are stored in there. And if you were to do a Docker inspect, it would show you which layers are which. And then there's a merged view at the top. So again, that sort of union file system functionality that we can see that we pick up things from the different layers as we go along. If you delete a file, by the way, what happens is it's really putting in uh, what we call a white file there just to modify, just to block it and to note that it's deleted and kind of so it doesn't show up. That's the way a deletion works. If you were to do a Docker info, you can see there's information about which driver it's using. You can also see where it's stored in there. And you can also go and look in the Docker area itself and start to get an idea of where things are stored like containers, images, networking, and so on, all the things that it's managing for you. So really, let's quickly, let's talk about Docker alternatives, because as I said, Docker is not the only game in town. And these days, it's important to understand what else is out there. So not, um, I guess, maybe 2015 or so, Docker and the Linux Foundation, Linux Foundation for Open Software, established this idea of an OCI, Open Container Initiative. The idea was that if we, if we do a standard, we have a standard for how images are defined, how things are uh, exercised, run, those kinds of pieces in there, the specs, then other things could do the same thing that Docker did. Okay, so that's the idea with that. And then at, from that has come these other areas, other pieces you can use. Things that have been around for a long time are kind of at the bottom, like Cryo, Rocket, Run C. These are all ways of working with containers. For the most part, they're container runtimes. They're things that can build containers and work with containers, look at them. Uh, Podman and Builda and Kaneko are ones we're going to talk about just a little bit more as other options you may see today. But really quickly to kind of understand why people wanted something different from Docker uh, as well. Docker has a security issue or has had for a long time. Um, that is that the daemon or daemon, depending on how you say it, that runs the process runs as root, has to run as root to have access to things. And so it's responsible for the state of containers, requires root privileges and runs at the root user. Now, as you can imagine, that doesn't is exactly thrilling if you're trying to be secure about things. For the most part, when you're interacting with Docker, you're gonna be using Docker CLI, which is gonna send things to a daemon that's running either remotely or locally. And so you're not really having to interact necessarily with the daemon, but there's still a possibility that uh, something breaks out of the container. If it did, it would have the same sort of access and rights as the host OS. Now, as of version 1903 of Docker, they introduced something called rootless, uh, which is that allows it not to run as root. Uh, it does have some extra limitations and setup about it, but that fact that the daemon has run as root uh, causes people heartburn sometimes. So the Open Container Initiative, as we said, the goal was to define open standards for OS level virtualization Linux containers, uh, including things like the runtime specification and the image specification. And these standards then result in us having more flexibility between tools, uh, better insight in containers. You understand more about how they work as you use the different tools. And if you switch out a tool, you're not, you're not restricted to the specification that was there for Docker or something. You can use a different tool to run with it. One of the ones is Builda, B-U-I-L-D-A-H. Uh, it's alternative, has similar commands to Docker. This one's pretty similar in terms of the command structure and such that you can run. Uh, each of these has its own little eccentricities kind of when you're trying to install and work with it, but it allows for building images without a Docker file. What I mean by that is it has command line uh, pieces that can emulate or can do the same things as the various commands you would put into a Docker file. So if you wanted to write a batch script or something, you could write that with build a commands instead of having to have a Docker file out there, a separate text file for it. You could build stuff on the fly that way. It provides a CLI to build an OCI or traditional Docker images. Um, Podman is another one. Red Hat, I think uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 8 only shipped with Podman, didn't come with Docker. Uh, this specializes in managing entire container lifecycle supporting OCI standard. And one of the things that it does is it allows you to run things as pods. So we have this idea of pods 
which really come into their own in Kubernetes, but it basically is a group of containers. It's a way to group containers together. You might, for example, group containers together so they could talk to each other more easily or share storage, those kinds of things. In Kubernetes, we talk about pods as being that wrapper or that container, sorry, that enclosure or the multiple containers. Uh, if you want a uh, funny way to remember this, think about the whale as the mascot for Docker. What do you call a group of whales? A pod, right? So you have the pod. So pod is a group of containers. So Podman has some support for that. And it's intended more for kind of running the containers, managing them over the life cycle, as opposed to build a, which is really kind of just a, um, an alias almost for Docker in a lot of ways. Finally, there's Kaneko. Kaneko, or Kaneko, depending on how you say it, I say Kaneko is an open source tool used to build images without root access. What it does is it actually runs through and builds things from based on Docker files, but it does it in a user space. And basically it runs it inside of a container or it runs it inside of a Kubernetes cluster. Kubernetes, if, uh, if you haven't heard that word, is basically a, a uh, system for running lots, lots of sets of containers and making sure they stay up function, all those kinds of pieces. Uh, so this is really more used kind of when you get into the Kubernetes space as a way to build images on the fly in there. All right, I think we are pretty much out of time.